Uh, this is the second night of the Iowa City Book Festival this year. We got a good start last night with our Paul Engel Prize ceremony, where we gave our prize to two writers, uh, the poets Toy Derricote and Cornelius Eady. Uh, that was at the Corville Public Library. Uh, we've had some hearty souls who have been reading War and Peace on the, uh, underneath the overhang at the graduate, if you've seen them. If you do see them, stop and give them a listen, because uh, that's quite a, a task that they're doing. Uh, from 9 o'clock yesterday morning, uh, excuse me, Monday morning, this is the third day of things, uh, Monday morning all the way through until the afternoon of Friday, they will be out there reading every single word of War and Peace. Uh, so they are taking breaks overnight, so uh, they, we do let them sleep. Uh, and then, of course, we have tonight's event. We have many, many other events throughout the course of the week. We have more than 50 events throughout the entire festival. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to pick up a book festival program, we have some over here. There's some out at the Prairie Lights table, and they're all around town. So I hope you'll take the opportunity to see what's going on and find some other things to join us for. But tonight, we are all here for John Sanford. So as Cedar Rapids native, Sanford is the author of more than 50 books, including 29 books in the Prey series, starring Lucas Davenport. And as of yesterday, 12 in the Virgil Flowers series with the publication of Bloody Genius, which is why we're here tonight. He's also a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist who earned two degrees from the University of Iowa before launching his journalism career. So his first books came out in 1989, but I started reading him in 2002, so I was a little bit behind the curve. He came to Iowa that year on a tour with his friend and fellow writer Chuck Logan. Now, my guess is that he was hoping to raise his friend's profile by coming along with him, but it was actually Logan that raised his profile for me. <laughs> and I'll explain why. I was a writer for the Cedar Rapids Gazette at the time, and I was reviewing Logan's book to preview this event, and I hadn't read any of Sanford's books at that point. He was a New York Times bestseller, and I was into much edgier things, and I thought, you know, if he's appealing to those folks, he wouldn't be for me. Um, that was not the first time I'd been wrong, and it certainly won't be the last because I read the first of the Prey books, and then I got the most recent book at that time, and three more before the year was out. So I was definitely hooked. And since then, I've had the pleasure of reading that series kind of from both ends. I've kept up with every case that's happened since then, and occasionally when I need a fix, I can go back and pick up where I left off. But he's made that much more difficult because he's now writing these Virgil Flowers books as well. So I have two books to keep up with each year but it's a pleasant task that I have to take on. So we have tried to get John to come to the book festival for several years. Those Flowers books always come out in the fall, and every year I put in my request, and every year the publication date of his books has changed, and we haven't been able to make it work. So this is a long time coming. So welcome to Iowa City, John. Appreciate that. <laughs> So here's how things will work. I am going to have a little Q&A with John and ask uh, some questions that hopefully he will answer. And then uh, I'm going to open it up for a Q&A with the crowd. Uh, we don't have time for all of you to ask questions, but we will hopefully get to quite a few of you. So if you will indulge me, I'd like to have a little bit of conversation before we get started on that. So thank you. Am I, am I live here? Can you hear me? I think there? so. I saw the people reading War and Peace. And I kind of detoured around him because I wasn't exactly sure what was happening there. The, <laughs> the woman was standing there reading, but nobody was listening to her. And I thought she was, <laughs> she was just kind of reading out into open space, and I thought, oh, <laughs> there's a problem. And so I guess <laughs> all right. Well, what we need to do is get you to join them, and then we can bring all these folks with. So right. maybe we'll do that later. And it was raining. Which was <laughs> a, uh, yes. I said they're hardy souls. Yeah, so yeah. good. So um, because of your roots here in Iowa, I wanted to ask some questions that pertain to that to get us started. Um, in interviews that you've given over the years, including one that I did with you back in 2008, you had mentioned how much you loved the public library, particularly the Cedar Rapids Public Library, and that you spent a lot of time there. You might have even mentioned reading all the books that they had there for kids at one point. I was curious, did that set you apart? Did you feel different from the other kids because you were so into books, or was that just normal for kids back then? Well, for one thing, uh, uh, Cedar Rapids, uh, and I don't know what the situation is there. I haven't lived here for a long time in Cedar Rapids, but uh, the situation then was uh, it was a terrific library system. Uh, not only did it have a good central library and several nice branches, it also had bookmobiles. And uh, we didn't have all this kind of uh, problems with separation of church and state back then. So <laughs> at some problem, at, at some point, uh, when I was a kindergartner, um, 
the bookmobile came and parked in the All Saints uh, Church parking lot, and, and the nuns marched us out, and we all got library cards. <laughs> and so you got a library card in Cedar Rapids at most schools, I think, when you were in a kindergarten. And then you could start borrowing books on your own. It's probably the first thing I actually owned by myself. And, uh, and they just had a, a terrific system. And I mentioned last night when I was doing a program in Des Moines that uh, the first time I soloed in the car, uh, I went to the library. Uh, I went down to the Central Library in Cedar Rapids. Um, and, and I think, uh, well, there are a few things that are fairly crucial, I think, if you're going to grow up to be a writer. One of them is you've got to have support from your parents when you're young, and I did. Uh, but uh, reading is absolutely crucial. Uh, and, and, and I have been forever grateful to the Cedar Rapids Public Library for giving me the opportunity to read anything I wanted as long as I wanted. And I got to know the librarians, and they would start saving stuff for me because they recognized. And they, and they, and they would say, you know, you like that, you'll probably like this. Um, and this isn't a big library. Uh, so I, I think I was kind of an unusual kid. But there were a lot of kids who were reading, mm -hmm. and and one of the things, that, one of the things that happened, I think maybe with the rise of the internet, um, was that was that was that libraries sort of lost their importance, and there were a couple of other things going on. I don't know if they go on here in Iowa City, but in a lot of big cities now. I live in Santa Fe, and a lot of big cities have this kind of insoluble problem of street people. The street people use the library as a shelter in a place where they can go and they can also get uh, free books and they can get on the internet for free. And, and, but they tend to drive away other customers and, and now some of the libraries have become, uh, they've become difficult, more difficult places to go. They were extremely welcoming uh, when I was uh, in Cedar Rapids. And, uh, and street peoples are, are a problem that I'm, I'm very interested in. And my wife and I, uh, mostly my wife, we have sort of sponsored a street guy in Los Angeles now for almost 20 years. Uh, we send him money every month. We go to visit him when we're there. We try to take care of him the best we can. Uh, but, you know, it's a drop in the bucket. And, and, and so I'm, I'm very aware of the, the street people problem, but I'm also aware that it's, it seems to be damaging a lot of libraries um, because it is... Uh, it damages the libraries in Los Angeles. And one of the problems then is that the politicians no longer are so interested in supporting them as they should be. And uh, when I was a newspaper columnist up in uh, St. Paul, the St. Paul City Council wanted to close a branch library on what's called the West Bank. And the West Bank was primarily a lot of Hispanic uh, folks who were, who were moving into the city. Uh, and more than most people in the city, they needed a library. And at the same time, because they couldn't vote, um, the, the city council, you know, wasn't so interested in giving them a lot of support. Well, the paper fought it. And I, I, you know, I started it, and then the paper got behind it, and we saved the branch library, and it's still there. Um, I think, you know, when I was a kid, uh, we weren't exactly poor, but we, there was no extra money around. Um, my father uh, worked for the Postal Service, and my mother uh, was a clerk at what's now North America Rockwell, was in Collins Radio Company. And um, so, so I was one of those kids who was reasonably bright. You know, I'm not a genius, but, but, but uh, you don't, when books cost what they cost, and they were expensive even at the time, um, a public library is a great gift, being able to go down and get them for free. And you don't have to pay extra tax money. You don't have to do anything. Just go down there and get the books. And as long as you reliably bring them back, you can keep getting more books. And so uh, I've always been a big library supporter. I think they're absolutely essential for communities. Well, we're obviously in the right place to be making a statement <laughs> like that. I think I, everyone here would agree that that statement is true. I'd happy to make that statement any place because, <laughs> yeah. because I, I am a, a, a seriously devout believer in libraries. Good. Well, so yeah. by the same token, you read a lot when you were a kid. I was curious, did you write things? Were you one of those kids that makes up stories and writes them, or was that something that came later in life? No. Uh, my first uh, literary success was in fifth grade. <laughs> I, had, I had an unnatural um, ability to imitate Dr. Seuss. 
<laughs> I could write really stupid poetry that had that same rhythm, you know, that da 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 So uh, we have every year, in, like most elementary schools, we had programs for the parents at the end of the year or late in the year sometime, and uh, where the kids had performed various acts and, and, and you know, little plays and read stuff. There was a kid there who I won't identify because he might be in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> but but he, he, uh, he, he was very unfortunate. He was a very unfortunate kid. He was uh, large and ungainly and a little bit dumb. Uh, he was unclean so that he smelled bad almost all the time. Um, he was incontinent is the problem, I guess. Uh, I think he was probably abused by his parents. Uh, and he, he uh, smelled bad, so nobody would sit near him, and they, nobody wanted to talk to him. And he was also a bully. He would beat kids up. He was the biggest kid in the class. But at any rate, uh, some of the kids weren't very successful in writing stuff, and so the teacher, who was a lady whose name I don't remember, asked me if I would, because I wrote stuff all the time, she asked me if she could use some of my stuff for the other kids. And so... Um, this kid uh, read one of my uh, one of my Dr. Seuss poems, and his mother was in the audience. And when he successfully completed it, and people were applauding, she started to cry, and that uh, made a seriously deep impression on me, because it was it was not just it was not necessarily good because I was a great guy for doing this. Is that you feel this little buzz of power? You know, you actually you actually <laughs> affected somebody pretty seriously by writing, and uh, you know, this poor woman, uh, they they just came from a really tough family on a bad part of Cedar Rapids. Uh, that might have been the happiest thing that she had experienced in a long time, and I got that little buzz, which is not entirely you know a wonderful thing, but I mean, you know, I got it. So, hmm. and uh, I've always thought that people aren't really talented. You've got to have a certain intellectual ability to, to, to go that way. But I, I think that most kids that are seen as talented, something happens often almost by accident, sometimes because you got mean parents. But almost by accident, you, you do an art form or mathematics or something like that at an early age, and you become known as being good for that among your peers. And so, you know, little Johnny can draw. And so then little Johnny draws more. And so then he's in third grade, and he's, he's at least two or three years ahead of all the other kids in the class drawing. So now everybody thinks Johnny's a great artist. And so he continues to push that advantage, and he gets good at it. And uh, I mean, you know, Michael Jackson started singing when he was five years old professionally. <laughs> and, uh, and so, and, and he was 17, I think, before, what was that? The, Mary Jane or something other what, what in that song. Yeah, whatever it was. He was like 17, yeah, well done. He was like 17, he was like 17 or 18 when, when he really had a hit on And so he had been a professional musician at that point for 12 years or something like that before he really hit the big time. People don't think of it because he was still so young, but he was. And I think that's how talent develops. And I think that I was lucky in that in that I was encouraged right from the beginning to write and also from the beginning to read. And so by the time I was a senior in high school, I was recognized as one of the better writers in the school. And I actually had an English teacher who said, you should pursue this because I think you're good at it. And, and you know, that's not something kids are often told. So. Okay. Well, I want to fast forward a little bit from elementary school. Uh, when you came here to the University of Iowa, it was the mid-60s, if I'm uh, correct. Yeah, early 60s. And so... Those of us who weren't here at the time, but we look back at that era in Iowa City, particularly from a literary standpoint, it was kind of a golden age. The names of people who were coming through here, you know, Kurt Vonnegut was teaching here. He was probably working on Slaughterhouse Five up the hill when you were about to graduate and things like that. Did, did that he feel a, like that to Kurt, you when you were here? Uh, it was Kurt Vonnegut, I think, Kurt Vonnegut, who had an apricot colored mohair sweater that he wore every day for like 920 writers' <laughs> workshops in a row. And, uh, and um, I used to sit in the student union and talk to Nelson Algren. Uh, you know, may his soul be blessed. He was a, just a big influence, and he was just one heck of a writer who was un treated unfairly, I think, by a lot of literary people. Um, 
But uh, yeah, it was, it was pretty cool. And uh, I had an ulterior motive for going to the workshop is because I didn't have any money. And I actually had to drop out for a semester to work um, uh, to get through. But uh, college was actually affordable then, unlike it is now. Uh, if you worked hard during the summer, and I did, I, I got a job, uh, I, I, I had several different jobs during the summers, but you could, you could pay your tuition and, and a pretty good piece of your, of your you know, apartment cost if you just worked hard all summer. Now, I mean, I don't know what it, University of Minnesota in-state tuition now is like 12,000 bucks. I mean, how in the hell is a kid, I mean, I mean you know, even living at a home, you have a hard time, hard time doing that. It's really unfair and rotten. Uh, in my opinion. Um, but at any rate, uh, I would go to the writer's workshop. I was trying to take 19 credit hours a semester because I could get out of school a semester early if I did that. The good thing about the writer's workshop is that you could only take it for six hours, but you could take it any combination of hours. I don't know if you could still do that. So I could take like six three-hour courses, which would get me to 18, and then I'd need a one-hour course, which were pretty rare, but the writer's workshop, had, you could take it for one hour. So I think I took six semesters of writer's workshop, or five semesters, taking it for either one or two hours so that I could get to that magic 19 number and get out of school a semester early. And uh, so I graduated with my class right on time, but I took a semester off in the middle, um, you know, to earn some more money. And then you started to do journalism when you were in the Army. Is that yeah. correct? The Army sent me to, I was yeah. going to be a lawyer, actually. Um, that was my intention. And then uh, I, went to, I went into the Army, and the Army sent me to, to uh, Army Journalism School, which turned out to be a pretty good school, pretty good journalism school, because they didn't fool around with a lot of bullshit. They, they, <laughs> they, they, they just sort of beat it into you. And, and, uh, and, and they, have a thing, they had a thing called AP style. Uh, which was, you know, you could, and I, and I got so good at it over the years that I could actually dictate routine stories without writing them down. Uh, you know, I had to write down a name and something so I could say, you know, 27-year-old uh, Joe Smith was driving his Pontiac GTO down Highway 441 south of Miami when he, you know, ran over a kid. And, I, you know, I could just about dictate a story. It's called, it's called AP Style, which was You'd figure out what the most important facts are, and then you'd stack them in a paragraph, in a pyramid, they'd call it, I think. And, and, uh, and at any point, because of the newspaper, they could cut the bottom of the pyramid off. They could cut it all the way back to the first paragraph where there'd only be, you know, John Smith ran over a kid. Um, so, so you learned that style, and they just literally beat it into you in the Army. But it was a pretty useful lesson in, in how to prioritize things and how to edit yourself. And then you came here, came back, to go to well, the after, I got, program, after I got out right? of the Army, uh, I worked for a year in Missouri at the uh, oh, Cape Girardeau, right. Southeast yeah. Missouri, yeah. which was an interesting experience because there was a lot of the civil rights activity was going on then, and uh, they had a ferocious series of riots in Cairo, Illinois, uh, which is not pronounced Cairo, uh, it's Cairo. And uh, even though it's part of Illinois called Little Egypt, where the, <laughs> where, where the, where the striptease dancer got her name from, because that's where she came from, Little Egypt did. And that's where the town of Thebes is, and, uh, <laughs> and some other stuff. <laughs> but at any rate, uh, Cairo had a, a, a really vicious, a really vicious series of race riots. Uh, they happened because the town was 50-50 white and black. Uh, the uh, whites had a swimming pool that black kids were not allowed to go to, and when they were ordered to integrate the pool, the city filled up the pool with concrete uh, so that it was no longer a swimming pool. They then had, uh, they then had these race riots, and, and uh, the black folks in town uh, started boycotting the businesses. Well, the businesses couldn't survive without the black. They were 50% of the population. And, and, and so tempers got really serious. Uh, the cops were all white. Uh, and what eventually happened is that, is that both the blacks and whites, I hate to, ex I, I don't know any other way to characterize it, they were both rednecks. The whole bunch of them were black and white. They all drove pickup trucks and had deer rifles. Well, the, the, so, the, so the black guys ran out in the middle of the street, and if you looked down the street, you could see the police station. They'd fire one shot from the deer rifle and run back inside their house, and nobody knew where they were at. And if you go to Cairo, Illinois, the last time I was there, which is probably 15 years ago, they still had a big 
steel shield up in front of the door so that, so that you couldn't run out of the house in the black section and shoot the cop the, the police station. Um, I mean, that's how vicious it was. And eventually, uh, one of the leading white guys there, one of the people who was most, uh, who, who was most anti-black, I guess you'd say, had a lumber yard, and they burned that sucker down, and uh, you could see the flames for, you could imagine what a stack of, what a stack of, uh, you know, two by fours that's, uh, you know, 100 yards long and 50 yards wide going up in smoke looked like. I mean, you could see that forever. And uh, I hate to say it, I had a pretty good time there. It was, <laughs> it was uh, you know, it was. Uh, it's not where I thought we were going to go. Yeah, that's not where I thought okay. I was going to go either. I had, a, I had an old guy, uh, probably, Probably, when I say an old guy, he's probably younger than I am now, tried to strangle with my, 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 my camera strap on the street because I was taking pictures of some of the demonstrators. And uh, so, uh, <laughs> OK. And then, um, I, and then I came back. <laughs> and then you came back, OK. <laughs> then I came back. OK, dot, 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 then I came back, uh, OK. Uh, um, and then you came back, and you got a master's degree in journalism here and went off into the journalism world. And it right. seemed like you, obviously, uh, we're quite uh, prepared for that, and, and we're quite good at it. Uh, you know, winning a Pulitzer Prize is nothing to sneeze at. And moving in that direction, at what point did you start to think, maybe I'd like to try novels well, I, uh, or doing that type of thing? You know, or was it always kind of in the back of your mind? I always thought that? about it. Yeah. I always thought about it. And the other thing that happened was that I was working in Miami, and most of the time I was a reporter, but they decided they wanted to try me to be an editor for a while, which I didn't really like very well, and I didn't want to do, but they made me the city editor of the Lauderdale Bureau, and I had about 30 people working for me, I guess, editors and, um, and reporters. And uh, so I had, uh, I, w I was desperate to fill up the section as, a, as an editor, and I had this very talented young reporter there, and uh, who was a good writer. Uh, he did really good features. And um, one day I was driving to work from, I lived in northern, the county that, I lived in northern Dade County, which is Miami, and I was going up to Fort Lauderdale, which is in Broward County, and I drove past the Gulfstream racetrack. And uh, what I noticed is that there were hundreds of horses and uh, I was always desperate to fill up a section with feature stories because we didn't always have the news, that, you know, the hard news stuff. And it popped into my mind, they've got hundreds of horses there in an urban area. What do they do with all the horse shit? <laughs> and uh, this is probably not something that a lot of people would wonder about. Uh, but, but, you know, if you reach that certain edge of desperation, uh, you're going to, you ask yourself those kinds of questions. So I... I sent the reporter, this younger reporter, down there. he begged me not to send him. He said, like, please don't make me do this. Please don't make me do this. And I said, you know, screw it, Carl. Get down there and do it. So Carl went down and wrote the story, and he came back and, and uh, wrote the story. And the story was so good that the main paper down in Miami stole it for their front page. Uh, which I bitterly resented, but um, <laughs> but at any rate, Carl's been uh, the Carl I've talked about is Carl Hyacin, who writes. Uh, you know, yeah. he's pretty good. Yeah, he's pretty good, <laughs> and uh, he was pretty good at the time. And this actually leads up part way to answer your question. Carl was already writing stuff with uh -huh. another guy named Bill Montalbano. They had written three uh, detective thriller type novels, and uh, together. And um, I think Montalbano supplied the plots and Carl supplied the writing. And um, so when I, I could see him doing that, and, uh, and he was a really talented writer, he still is. Um, and so what I did was, was that um, I, I decided that I had to leave Miami because Miami fed into too many things that were bad for me. Because um, I, I, I really like running around town and looking at bodies. Uh, you know, you know, too much so, and 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 so the thing is, is that, uh, and you know, I, I wrote a lot of drug stories because that was the big cocaine time and all that kind of stuff, and I knew a lot of druggies, and I knew, I knew a guy who, you know, you say, uh, you know, can I buy an ounce of weed from you? And he said no, and you say, well, I heard you sell weed, and he says, yeah, but I got 500 pounds in my attic, and I'm not dealing in ounces, and and uh, so so anyway, the guy, uh, so so. I, uh, I decided that if I was going to get out of newspaper work, and I could see that it was burning me up a little bit, uh, and I wanted to write novels, or nonfiction, but novels probably, um, 
and so I decided the paper offered me a transfer. When I told them I was going to quit, they offered me a transfer to St. Paul, which seemed like a fairly quiet place. And it wasn't too far from my folks who lived over in Wisconsin. So um, I went up there, and um, after a few years, uh, I won a Pulitzer, and then I quit uh, because that seemed like some kind of period at the end of my, my uh, journalism career. Um, and I wrote a, a really terrible book called Chippewa Zoo, um, which never got published, never will be. Uh, <laughs> my, my, my son has a copy of it, and every once in a while he'll take time out to ridicule me for it. <laughs> uh, uh, basically, it was, a, it was uh, set in the near future, well, 50 years out, 50 or 60 years out. And it was a time when the world was pretty much at peace. And, uh, and they had these places called zoos where people who didn't fit in society would go. And they had all kinds of different zoos and all kinds of different places. But if you didn't fit, you might fit in a zoo someplace. It wasn't any kind of fascist thing. You'd go there voluntarily. So the Chippewa Zoo was a zoo up in Canada. And uh, what happened is that the people who actually were the main inhabitants of this zoo were fur trappers who would go out in the fall and they would spend the winter trapping fur out in, the, out in the north woods, and then they would come back in. It was like old time fur trappers. The difference being that it was administered by a big ministry out of Toronto, um, and, uh, or out of Windsor, or one of those places up there, and at any rate. So um, this woman came there, and she was an administrator, and she had a, an affair with like one of the leading trappers, a guy who was sort of, of a, um, uh, he was sort of the the priest or the minister for the group. He would he would he would memorialize people who died. So he was a little bit of a power with the group, and they had this relationship. And I won't tell you the whole story because it's terrible. But it fell apart. <laughs> but but my my uh, and and then they had they had satellite uplinks and stuff like that. And guys would cash in their furs and they'd go down you know to Miami or wherever, and then they'd come back up and go back out for the winter time. So and my agent read it and she said, you know, John. Um, the feminists are going to hate the fur trappers, and the fur trappers are going to hate the feminists, and the sci-fi guys are going to hate both the fur trappers and the feminists, and nobody's going to like the nerds who run the uplinks. She said, there's nobody left, you know? <laughs> Everybody is going to hate your book. And uh, so I, you know, I kind of reread the book, and, and um, I decided she was right. And, and so then I, I, I did what most writers should do, throw the book away. Don't try to fix it. Don't try to rework it. Throw it away and do a different one. And uh, that's what I did. So I know I have a lot of people probably wanting to ask questions, so I'm going to keep fast forwarding through things a little bit here. Um, so you have written all of these Davenport books, and then you get this idea. You've got this character, Virgil Flowers, and you think about spinning him off and, and doing his own separate series. Was that always the thought of doing those no. at the same time, or you were thinking of maybe phasing one into the other? How did all that come about? Well, uh, there were two things. First of all, like Virgil's a character, I had him in a Davenport book, and at one point, uh, a woman was about to be killed by a guy, or by, I guess it was by another woman, actually, and uh, Virgil was there, and Davenport was rushing to the scene to try to stop this murder, and Virgil was right across the street, and the woman pulls out a gun, and she's about to shoot the other woman, and Virgil shoots her. And Davenport comes running up, and she, he said, why in God's name did you shoot her in the foot? You know, she was going to kill him. You should have shot her in the chest. And Virgil said, I was aiming at her chest. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, everybody, everybody, uh, I got a lot of reaction to the, to, the, to the Virgil character. So then the other thing that happened was that newspapers were going in the toilet. I mean, they, newspapers, I, I once worked for, well, my entire career was, except for the Missouri episode, were, were with the Knight Ritter newspaper chain, which owned Miami, Detroit, Philadelphia, Dayton, uh, a big one out on the West Coast someplace, uh, the St. Paul paper, and a couple of others. That corporation no longer exists. It's gone. Uh, and uh, all the papers have been sold to different hedge funds and parceled out, and everybody lost their shirts. Um, and the thing is, it was a good chain, but, uh, but it had stupid management. It was one of the problems. But, but one of the things is that, is that um, 
I started to worry about a lot of my friends. So what I did was I told, I think it was six or seven of my friends, that if they would come up with an idea for a book, uh, and they had to give me an outline, a pretty complete set of characters and stuff like that, I would write the book and we'd cut the money in half. And there was enough money involved to give them a really good boost into retirement because they were mostly my age and uh, they were getting close to retirement. I think most of them would have required, retired someplace in the early 2000s. Um, so they were, they were, one of them was a school teacher, but all the rest of them were, were, uh, uh, were newspaper reporters. And uh, I don't know, I think we started out you know, cutting up a million and a half bucks or something like that, so they'd get seven fifty. Then you had to pay taxes and agent and all that kind of crap. But but it was enough that you know, like one guy bought a cabin and and uh, one guy one guy put all of his money into investment funds. <laughs> it's like he didn't get any joy out of it all. He just put it all into investments. But but uh, that's where Virgil came from, and, that, and that's why the stories are kind of weird. They're kind of you know, like one guy had this plot. He was a reporter down in southern Minnesota when he ran into this weird church group that he thought was involved with some child sex stuff. And he wrote this really grotesque story uh, that I turned into a Virgil book that had kind of some funny stuff in it, but it always makes me a little nervous when I see that book because I, di I didn't like that story. Uh, but, you know, like, you get committed to a certain point and you can't get out of it. And he thought it was sort of an important story to tell, and then when I write the book, and I've got to put all the Virgil stuff in there, and he didn't particularly care for the book because, you know, he thought that I, like, downplayed some stuff that I should have played up, and I was saying, you know, that's, that's too grotesque for me. I can't do that, man. It's just like... But that's where Virgil came from. It started out as a bunch of friends, you know, trying to, uh, try to um, uh, you know, get them into, re into a softer retirement than they would if the, if the company just suddenly went belly up. And I know uh, Chuck Logan that I mentioned in the introduction was one, of, one of those. He did yep. the second one. Yep. Um, are you still doing that with those folks? No, I haven't uh, noticed well, that in the, the acknowledgments uh, lately. The last one I did, um, the last one I did was with a woman named Michelle Cook, and I and, and I, I got the money back from that one by marrying her. <laughs> so so uh, so that worked out. And then I did a I did about four of them just pretty much on my own, mm, okay. and and uh, so. I, I just didn't want to stop using the character, but I'm only going to write one book next year. I'm not going to write two. I'm going to write a Davenport book, but, but Virgil is going to be in that book as a major character. Uh, but it's basically going to be a prey novel. Ooh, okay. Now, is that a sign of things to come? Are you getting it's off a sign of that? That, It's a sign that I'm getting old. <laughs> you know? and I, and I, and, I didn't want to go there. Well, you know, I, I, I almost literally work every day of the year. I'll be working later tonight. Um, I'm all set up. Uh, with my laptop, and uh, which I carry with me every place, and I got a couple of you know thumb drives that I plug into it. That's got the whole novel on it. I'm about fifty thousand words into the next prey book. I'll try to get a thousand words knocked out tonight before I go to bed. And uh, I, I I I just have to work all the time, and I've gotten to the point where I want to stop. Sure. When you were working, particularly over the last few years, and doing a couple novels a year, and, and with the books that you've written with your wife. The, the YA books, you've right. done three books a year. Are you working sequentially? Are you taking notes on one thing that you'll write down the road? You're working on something else and editing something else? Or how do you balance all of that? Well, uh, I have a, a friend of mine is a former police chief of, of, uh, in St. Paul, and, and he read a few of my books, and he said, one thing I noticed was that uh, Davenport don't do a lot of paperwork. And uh, that's, uh, that's all. It's also the case with me. I, I don't do a lot of notes. Uh, what I do is I just let stuff cook up in my head. I've got an idea. One of the one of Davenport's daughters named Letty, and I have an idea that someday I ought to write a Letty book, just with Letty as the main character. And and um, so I have an appointment to go to lunch with an oil guy from um, from uh, Midland, Texas, down there in the Texas oil patch. Uh, to see how uh, he's a pretty heavy-duty executive with a big oil company. I'm going to find out how you can steal a lot of oil on a regular basis. If I can figure that out, if I, if I can figure that out in a credible way, I'm, I'm going to may turn that into a Letty now in the next year or so. And uh, Letty will be sent by her boss, who is an oil company executive, uh, sort of modeled after uh, T. Boone Pickens. Uh, and 
he'll say, you know, we seem to be coming up a couple million bucks short a year. We can't figure out exactly where the leak is. And she is sent down to the oil patch to try to figure out where the leak is. And I don't know where to go with that. The guy across the street from me uh, said, well, you shouldn't do that. You should ought to do silver. He used to run a silver mine and a, also a diamond mine and also a, he, was, he was with BHP Billiton, I think is the name of the thing. But at any rate, um, he thought that uh, when you, it turns out that when you dig silver out of the ground at the mine, you consolidate it into a higher level of silver, but it's still basically an ore, but it's about 50% silver when you get finished with it. Then you just load it into a coal car and ship it off to a refinery. Well, there would be an opportunity there just to pull a pickup truck up next to it, shovel off a few. But then I actually did the numbers on it, and it turns out you really can't steal enough silver to make a huge amount of money. You can make a few $10,000, uh, uh, you know, uh, you can make, you know, maybe ten dollars or $20,000 or $30,000 with a few pickup load truck loads, but then people would notice it. <laughs> then I read someplace that in the 80s, there was a road being built across a pipeline, and the pipeline people saw it, that there was a road being built, and they talked to people, and they made sure that there wasn't going to be any conflict. Turns out what they were actually doing is they were installing a drain pipe on the bottom of the pipeline <laughs> that was taking out oil. And this went on for quite a long time before the pipeline people figured it out. And um, so I'm going to ask this guy, how would you steal a lot of oil? Because, because the oil business is very disorganized. A lot of independents, a lot of, a lot of uh, you know, roughneckers guys out there, a lot of people, they call them midstream people who are driving big oil trucks around and, and uh, cleaning up spills and doing that kind of stuff. You know, if you, if you stole like one tank truck a day, or, no, or one tank truck a week, you could make a million bucks a year. And, but how would you do that? And uh, if I see four people leave the room, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll know somebody figured it out. <laughs> but, but at any rate, I'm going to meet with a guy on next Sunday, and if, and if he's got a way that he can, that sounds convincing, I, I might do a Letty book about her going down there and figuring out. Letty's a little bit of a sociopath, and she doesn't hesitate to kill people, so <laughs> she'd be a cool. Do you ever alarm people with the questions you ask them when yeah. you're doing this kind of research? I alarm people when I'm well, in the yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I, you know, uh, I, I, I think I could be a successful criminal if I wasn't a coward. You know, <laughs> like, a, like, you know, I detoured around the people reading War and Peace today because that's like... There you go. <laughs> Uh, but if you actually think about what criminals do, just, just think about what, how you'd feel if you went into a place intending to shoplift something expensive. And if you actually think about it, it'll give you the creeps. But then think about planning to murder somebody. Um, I, mean, I mean, you're talking about some kind of major intellectual, psychological dislocation there. And um, I'm interested in that kind of stuff. I, you know, I'd never hurt anybody, but I'm, I'm interested in I'm interested in people who, who, can, who can do that, who can think that way, who are so off on the edge of humanity that they, uh, they think that way. Well, I think we'll wrap up this portion here, but I wanted to ask you, we're here for Bloody Genius, and we haven't really talked very much about that. I was wondering if you wanted to give a little sales pitch. I know my friend Rob, when he interviewed you for the Gazette, you said the only question he forgot to ask was, was the book any good? Yeah. And you assured him that it was. Maybe yeah. you could tell folks here a little bit, and I'll go grab the microphone while you do. Yeah, the, the uh, Bloody Genius is about a university professor who gets murdered on page one. So I, I'm not giving you too much there. Um, uh, and, and Virgil Flowers is set up to the Twin Cities to uh, investigate it. And the first problem I had to deal with was uh, why would he be sent up to the Twin Cities to investigate it? Well, the governor, the governor likes Virgil because Virgil essentially made him governor inadvertently. Virgil doesn't like the guy, but the guy does like Virgil. So he asked that Virgil be sent up because one of the, the professor was the brother of one of his big political donors. And the donor is unhappy with the Minneapolis Police Department, which is quite a good police department. And uh, so that's, that's the genesis of the story. He sent up there to, to uh, you know, to figure out who killed the professor. And, and he works with a woman detective in the Minneapolis Police Department. I went to the Minneapolis Police Department where I talked to some women homicide detectives. Um, if you read the description of the Minneapolis Homicide Department in this book, that's what it looks like. It doesn't look like what you would think it would look like. For one thing, for a reason known only to accountants, I guess, is that, the, is that it's a very narrow room, but it goes around a corner of the building. So it's a big L-shaped room 
where different homicide detectives can't see each other. I mean, you know, like it, it, they're, they're spread all over the place. And, um, uh, and, and the women were very kind, the, the detectives I talked to there. And uh, so I made the detective, the, the Minneapolis detective uh, in this book, a, a, a woman detective who was also a friend of Lucas Davenport from the other series of books. Um, so that's what that is. I did uh, earlier this year the Davenport book, Neon Prey. Uh, I just mentioned this in passing because it, I, I got kind of a funny reaction. It involved the cannibal. Uh, and I was trying, you know, the biggest problem I have in writing these books is coming up with a villain. Because Davenport is set. We know what he's going to be like. You know, he's aging more slowly than any of the rest of us. But he, <laughs> but he, is, but he is, you know, he's tall, good-looking, rich, drives a Porsche, likes women, blah, blah, you know. And, and so we've got all those things going. But the villain is critical because he has to be a worthy opponent for Davenport. In some way or another, he has to be worthy. Maybe it's just pure violence. Uh, maybe he's a stupid guy who just does terribly violent stuff, or maybe he's a smart guy who only did one violent thing, but it has to be a worthy opponent somehow in coming up with them. So then I thought, well, you know, I've used up just about everything. Why don't, why don't I make him a cannibal? And, I, and when, you, when, you, when you talk about cannibals, you really talk about Hannibal the cannibal uh, in Silence of the Lambs. Um, but I didn't want to go up against Hannibal the cannibal because he's like the classic cannibal and it's a great character. And so I thought, well, how do I make a cannibal that's not Hannibal? And, and I decided to do it. My guy isn't crazy. He didn't look upon the, he didn't kill people to eat them. He didn't look upon them as, he didn't, you know, get really excited about the prospect of eating human beings. He just had this load of meat that he was about to take out and dump out in his backyard. So, you know, why not take out the back straps? You know, it's like he had a barbecue pit right there, and, and uh, he was about to bury this big chunk of meat, so why not? And uh, he's actually kind of embarrassed about it toward the end. I mean, he's a really bad guy, but it wasn't like, it, it wasn't like he was drooling over the prospect of eating somebody. He just, you know, he just kind of had, you know, 150 pounds of fresh meat. And, and so uh, I thought that would sort of leaven the cannibal aspect of it. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not sure it actually did, but that was the intention. Okay, I'm not sure how we segue from that, but we're going to try. Um, so, I have the handheld mic. We're going to start with this gentleman here. Please wait for me to give you the mic, because we do have folks who are watching on YouTube. I'm not going to be able to get to everyone, so if we can keep our questions to questions rather than statements, and if we can keep them succinct, we can get to a lot of folks here tonight. So we'll start over here. <laughs> Hi, how are you? Hey, I'm Steve. I live in Iowa City. Thanks for coming. I really enjoy your work. Um, I consume it mostly in audiobook format. And I'm question, uh, my question is, has that, have audiobooks changed the way you write or your stories? Um, P.S. I retired from Chevron if you need some pipeline stories. <laughs> <laughs> Could you could you repeat the question because I didn't hear all of this. Yeah. So yeah, go ahead. No, it's have, just, have audio books. Sorry. Have audio books changed the way you write, uh, the format of the story, or how you approach it? I love your narrators. Thank you. I don't. I actually don't know what the answer to that question is. I. I uh, uh, what I did was when I started out, I. Um, the, the thing that people who want to write have to understand is that you can actually teach yourself to do it if you're a good writer. If you, if you start out with some basic skills, you can actually teach yourself to write newspaper style like the Army taught me to write uh, AP style. And then, and, and the reason that, that, uh, the reason that uh, Chippewa Zoo was a failure was because I hadn't yet taught myself to write. So then I taught myself to write, and I think my style is a little bit fixed. And so, and so as, I, as I wrote through these, as I write through these books, I'm afraid sometimes that I have started to skim over stuff because I've written it too many times. And that's the only thing that changes. It might be a little bit too quick. And I, and I, don't, I don't maybe embroider scenes quite as much as I can with, with you know, tactile, sensual things. Um, so, um, so if my style has changed from the early books or, the, or has changed the way I write, it's mostly because of carelessness and, 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 and because I'm writing too fast now. I don't really, I, I was talking about the fact that I have, um, 
uh, that that when you have when you're writing two books a year, I'm probably writing four hundred thousand words and a year, and so I'm writing more than a thousand words a day. But half of those get thrown away because they're no good. So I'm writing because I'm trying to finish out about two books of a hundred thousand words a piece. So I'm doing all that writing. But when you get committed to a mistake, if you're writing two books a year, you can't go back. You've got to somehow rationalize that mistake and make it work out through the book because you've already written 20,000 words on it and you don't have time to throw those 20,000 words out like you should. So if anything has changed in the way I write, uh, it's because of the pressure of writing two books. Does that answer any of your questions at all? That's good. Thank you. All right. We've got a question over here. This gentleman. Hello. Um, I once saw a documentary about Ernest Hemingway and how he wrote. And it showed him storyboarding out, you know, the basic book and all the characters and that sort of thing. You alluded to a little, a little bit of how you write. Can you describe, I mean, like, do you know the ending before you start the book? And how, how do you keep all the characters straight and, and move it through to the end? Um, I don't, actually. Uh, I, 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 I struggle through the book. I like the idea of, of coming up with a basic concept, not knowing how it's going to end, but coming up with a basic concept and writing that out, because I think that gives you a certain cinema verite kind of quality to it, a documentary quality to it, because you don't know where you're going. You're kind of thrashing around, and it's not very clear exactly, even in your own mind, what's going to happen or how it's going to happen. And that, I think, for me at any rate, uh, causes some creative things to happen. Now, I go to a, a thriller writer's convention every summer in Manhattan, and uh, what I found there is that uh, most people have different ways of writing. Uh, the one thing that all of them are is persistent. All the good writers are persistent. They will, they will write all the time, and they, will, and, and they will go back, and they will go back, and they will go back, and they'll edit it, and they'll work it, and, and, they, and they write all the time, but they don't... Uh, all write the same way. There is one well-known um, writer who, who uh, says that when he finishes his outline, he essentially just has to fill it in to have a novel. In other words, if, if, if he's going to take a year to write a novel, eight months will be the outline. The last four months will just be filling in the details. Uh, it's, he essentially just fleshes out the outline. He does it completely. I have no outline. Uh, James Patterson has four or five guys working for him, and he acts as an editor in chief and also writes through the stories. But he doesn't, um, and and he is, is in charge of the creation of the plot and that kind of thing. Um, but but all of his books now are um, are, are done with other people. Um, he is on his own quite a good writer. Uh, as a matter of fact. Uh, his best books are the ones that he wrote by himself, not the, not the collaborations. The collaborations sometimes are pretty flat, and they seem to me pretty much cookie-cutter kind of stuff. But he's making something like $80 million a year. <laughs> which is, but I mean, you know, that's an incentive. And, and uh, uh, so, so there are all different kinds of ways of doing it, and, and my way of doing it is just my way, but other people do it completely differently. All right, we've got one here way in the back. Hi. Uh, are you ever going to revive the kids series? No. <laughs> <laughs> Why? I love kid. That. Kid is a kid is a good character. Uh, Robert Parker, you know, series of uh, of books are still going, even though Parker's been dead for fifteen years now. I think um, they're all written by other people, uh, and they star a character named Spencer. But if you're a longtime fan of Robert Parker like I was, you understand that Spencer uh, fought and got a medal in the Korean War. So that would make him approximately 90 years old now. <laughs> and no, seriously, I mean, you know, if you figure that the war was like, say, 1950, so now we're in 2020, that's 70 years. He had to be at least 20 to go, so he's 90, but he still goes down to the gym in Boston and boxes with Hawk. You know, so so I mean, you know, what does that mean? Uh, I have that problem with Kid. Kid was in Vietnam. Vietnam now, the fall of Vietnam now was 25, it was 45 years ago. 
So Kid has got, he was an officer, so he's got to be at least in his middle 60s, and that really kind of doesn't work with a, with a romantic character. And Kid, you know, the other thing is, is that if you read the early Kid books, which some people still do, they're still out there, Kid was working with like Commodore 64s. <laughs> and I mean, the whole technology from the time of the Kid now was completely and radically changed. My first uh, Rules of Prey book, at the end of the book, Davenport's trying to find a quarter so that he can go to a phone booth. And there are adult people walking around this city who have never seen a phone booth. And, and, and if you gave them a dial phone, they wouldn't know what the hell to do with it. And, and, uh, and the technology that, that Kid was involved with is now so changed so radically that, that um, I'm just not going to go there. All right, we've got a question here. Uh, thanks for coming. I'm also a graduate of All Saints and the Nuns and the Mobile, uh, <laughs> with the library. What, what the hell do you call it? I can't remember. Book, book, bookmobile. Anyway, the question I had is, what were you reading back then, and who do you like to read now? Well, I was reading all kinds of stuff the whole time. Um, and I, when I came to the University of Iowa here, I was an American Studies student. I think they called it American Civilization. I don't know if they, what they call it now. Uh, but, but the... Uh, the only books I remember from then was I read a lot of the, you know, the boy detective kind of stuff and the girl detective kind of stuff. Uh, and I also, there was a series of books, and I can't, uh, if anybody in the crowd is as old as I am, which I'm looking around, I'm not sure that anybody is, but, but I, I, there was a series of books out, and they took up about this much book space. And they were all the same length, and they were all had bright orange covers. And they were like, uh, they were always like, do you remember those? Yeah, yeah, and and I read all of them, and I mean, what they were is that they were they were sort of fictionalized narratives of American heroes, and uh, I can't uh, and I re I read all of them. They they were uh, that's that's the ones I remember. Augusta or Augustus, I read the same thing. They were just biographies. Yeah. Yeah, over and over. Yeah. Orange. I, I I don't I, I can't remember. Who, who did them or what? I just remember seeing all those orange books sitting there. I just started with one end and read through the other end. So. All right, we've got a question here. In your estimation, what is it about the genre of mystery that is so attractive to people? Why do people like it? What, what is it about it from your point of view? Well, they're entertaining. Uh, and if you're a reader, I mean, you're looking for entertainment. But some famous guy who I don't really know who it was said that um, said that uh, at some point men of great achievement at the pinnacle of their careers will write read nothing but mystery stories, and uh, I don't know. I mean, you know, when John Kennedy wrote uh, uh, read the, made the 007 books famous, and uh, Sarah Paretsky's book was under Bill Clinton's arm when he got off the plane in Chicago for the for the Illinois primary. Uh, so uh, I think that they're entertaining, but they're also simple. But, they, but they're also morality tales. They're tales in which justice usually prevails. And, and I think that a lot of those things people like because they're simple and, and they're clear and they're understandable. Um, I have a big problem. I mean, you know, I, I, I studied American literature when I was here and I was, uh, you know, and I, and I read all the guys up to the middle 50s. I guess, who were, who were famous. You know, Norman Mailer was probably the big guy when I was in school. But one of the things that bothered me about most literary stuff since then is that it tends to be psychological fiction in which you are getting information about a specific person's mind and you will never meet that person because he doesn't exist and you'll never be able to have any kind of further dialogue with him. And, and so exactly what have you learned? I think you'd be better off studying a good friend of yours and seeing how his mind worked than reading that stuff. But if you want to, if you read a thriller novel, you're getting, a lot of them have a lot of information about the culture in them, for one thing, but they're, but they're also entertaining. You know, they keep you going. They're like, uh, 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 you know, I, they're, they're, they're just like this old stories about Odysseus, you know, which are essentially adventure stories. And, uh, and, and, uh, uh, even those, I mean, the, the Homeric stuff has clues to what the history was back then and how things worked. And, the, you know, at one point Odysseus stops off 
uh, and at an island to get poison for his arrows. And all of a sudden, that cleared something up because I worked in archaeology for 15 years. And I thought, I was looking at the arrowheads that we were digging out, and I said, how in the hell did these ever kill anybody? Well, if they had poison on them, they probably did. But there's little little teeny metal things, you know. And so, so you find stuff out from adventure stories like the Odyssey and, uh, and the Iliad and, uh, and uh, that you don't find out from, from psychological narratives. So I, I think people like things that are clear, specific, action-driven, maybe says something about romance, you know. You know, one of the things I, I really like about your, your books is you have, you have such a great feeling for the landscape and for the people in it. I'm actually surprised to hear that you live in Santa Fe. I wonder, do you miss the Midwest? Do you have to come back to keep it fresh? Because um, you do a great job with that. I come back all the time. Uh, I, I, probably, I probably spend, I mean, I've still got a cabin up in Wisconsin that I go to. Uh, the, uh, the one part that I'm sort of losing, I can feel myself losing the grip on is the farm country. Um, I, did, I did an entire, one of my entire books, about three or four books back, was set in Iowa uh, with a major chunk of it at the Iowa State Fair, which I spent four days at. Um, and uh, that gave me a little bit of my grip back. One of the things that happened uh, in this book, the opening scene with Virgil in it uh, has him seeing a UFO, which you'll see what happens when you get to it. But, but uh, part of the crowd of people looking at the UFO was a woman in pink curlers. So I got to ask you, <laughs> when was the last, when, has anybody seen a woman in pink curlers in the last 10 years? No. Another one was a farmer wearing, uh, wearing overalls. When was the last time you saw a farmer in overalls? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. You, know, you know, Oshkosh, Oshkosh, I found out, is out of business. It's not out of business. Oshkosh is now a children's clothing line out of Atlanta. Uh, so uh, I actually looked it up. So I, I, I put that, a chunk of that first chapter online, and I immediately got all these things from my readers from my website saying, I don't have pink curlers in your hair, you idiot. <laughs> <laughs> so now that same woman in this thing has dreadlocks. Uh, and, and, and she's a, she's a farm lady. And, and a farmer is just wearing jeans and boots. And, and uh, you know, uh, and so, there, so that's the last time that I was deeply involved with the farm country. There were still a lot of guys walking around in, in, in overalls, but I've started to, I've started to lose... Uh, I've started to lose my grip on that a little bit. I really ought to come back and spend some time out there in the country. All right, I think we've got time for a couple more questions. We'll go here, no pressure on it. John, I think your, your character development is just unbelievable. I'm such a huge fan. And from Letty to Virgil to Johnson Johnson, I mean, really. <laughs> Can you give us one sentence on what is the key to great character development for a novelist? You actually have to think about it a lot. And, uh, you know, the, the thing is, is that, uh, is that I, I once wrote a book uh, and I gave it to my wife and she said, you know, you've got six characters in here named Bob. And uh, <laughs> there's a reason for that, actually. Uh, when you're na coming up with characters' names, you don't want to give distinctive names to throwaway characters because people will remember that name and they'll say, I wonder when he's coming back. And he doesn't come back. They've got a problem, but if his name is Bob Schwartz, he ain't coming back, you know? <laughs> so, so Lucas talks to somebody named Bob Schwartz in the streets, and the readers don't have to care about, it, care about him. So then you start thinking up, and, and you know, you don't write book like you read it. When you read a book, you read it in four hours or six hours or whatever. But when I'm writing a book, I'm thinking about it every day for several hours, for six months, and I'm coming up with stuff. So Johnson Johnson is uh, named... Uh, after his last, his family name is Johnson, but his first name is Johnson because his father named him after an outboard motor. And uh, he's, got a, he's got a brother named Mercury Johnson. And, and, uh, and, I, and I just mentioned Mercury a couple times because he's depressed uh, he's, about his name. And I had this guy idea, but I, I think that I blew it out. I was gonna have a sister named Evie Johnson after Evan Rude. And uh, because his father was a, you know, 
And so when you start developing that kind of stuff, because you're thinking about it, you know, you got Johnson Johnson. Here's the guy who has wrecked every machine that he's ever been on at least once, and sometimes several times. He wants Virgil to fly across the Rocky Mountains with him in an airplane. And, um, uh, and Virgil declines, but, but uh, you get something going with those guys. And, uh, you know, the, when you first meet Johnson Johnson, he's throwing beer cans out the window. And, uh, and Virgil always stops the truck, gets out, picks up the beer can, throws it in the back of the truck, and they drive on, and Johnson gives him a hard time about it. That actually came out of a, um, that actually came out of a book by the Southwestern writer who did the story about the, the Monkey Ranch Gang. Uh, Abby. Somebody will know him. Abby. Yeah, Abby. Edward Abbey. Abbey had somebody throwing a beer can out the window, and somebody criticized him. And Abbey said, it's not the beer can that's ugly, it's the road. So, oh, but anyway, Virgil, I, that was stuck in the back of the, my mind when I had, you know, uh, Johnson Johnson throwing beer cans out the window. So you just kind of accrete things. You know, you think of a character, and then you get them going, and then you just kind of add more stuff on top of it. All right, I think we'll have our last one over here. <laughs> Hello. So with all your characters being developed, which one is your favorite and why? Of all my characters? Yeah. Um, I was telling people last night, you know, Davenport and Virgil and, and, and other, some other characters, like some repeating characters like Johnson Johnson, are uh, just very familiar with me. I like them all. You know, I worked hard on them. So it's the villains that are important. And um, my favorite villain was Clara Rinker, who was in two books. And, she, and, I, and I'm sorry that I, you know, I eventually killed her off. Uh, <laughs> I mean, she sort of had to go, but she lasted for two books, and and uh, she was a woman who was uh, who was terribly sexually molested when she was young. When you meet her, she's like 16 years old, and she's a nude dancer in a in a in a really crude bar in in St. Louis, where she gets raped in the parking lot uh, by a customer, and she talks the brothers, a couple of really sleaze dog brothers, into bringing the guy down into the basement of the bar where she's going to break his arms. That's what the brothers think. She takes a baseball bat and hits the guy on the head with it and kills him. And the brothers dump the body in the river and leave the guy's truck over in the, across, the, across the river in Illinois where it's stolen. Um, but the thing is, is that she was so abused, and then because she broke this guy's head and she didn't have any remorse about it, any no bad feeling at all, a mafia guy comes in a few days later and she, you know, the question is, would you like to do this for a living? Because, you know, it's hard to find those kinds of people. And, and she did. And so she becomes a businesswoman and her primary business is killing people, innocent people. And that's how she gets involved with Davenport. She also runs a bar in Wichita, Kansas, and da Davenport unknowingly uh, one night dances with her. And, uh, and I just really liked her character a lot. And then I killed her off, and I sort of regret it. Because <laughs> she was smart, and she was very engaging, and, um, and she was tough, and she never had a chance from the beginning, and she made herself into something. All right. Well, with that, <laughs> help me to thank John Sanders.